When introducing students to history and theory of photography uh, at the academy where I do teach, uh, I often show them a selection of images such as these. What I ask them to do after each image is to vote whether they th saw in the reproduction, whether the image they saw in the reproduction was a photograph or whether it was not. I'm sure you can um, imagine the results. There mostly is an, an uh, unanimous vote on these three pictures as being photographs, while well, these two, by majority, are regarded as non-photographic. Now, the joke is that, one way or the other, each of these five images is photographic. These two are zincotype and uh, photoxylography, um, the zincotype being used to transfer black and white drawings into relief print clichés by means of a negative and gelatin bichromate as an emulsion. While photoxylography is wood engraving executed through a photograph directly printed on a boxwood block, coated with an albumin uh, emulsion and then printed. In the framework of this conference, however, I'm more concerned with the other three pictures. I wonder what makes these images, uh, what make these images um, photographs, despite their different materialities and appearances, or with other words, I wonder why and how we recognize these images as photographs, or rather not recognize them, but look at them as photographs are mostly looked at. And that is as kind of a transparent, kinds of transparent representations of, say, objects of the real world, whatever that may be. I think that the answer to these questions has to do with semblance in at least a double sense. Firstly, the photographs and the objects they depict are generally thought of as being somehow connected. Most prominently are paradigms such as the photograph being a trace or emanation, an imprint or an index of the object. This connection is thought of as sort of being responsible for a certain likeness between the object and the photographic image. Already the early critics of photography in the 19th century described the images as faithful, as true to life, or even as real. With other words, it seems as if the photographic image resembles the real object to a great measure. And secondly, if these images are all re um, pardon. and secondly, if these images are all recognized as photographs, then there must be a connection between these images too. They resemble each other not in what they depict, but how they do it. That is how they render the objects of the real world into photographic images. I think both semblances are crucial for recognizing or looking at a photograph as a photograph in the twisted way I just described. And I think that both kinds of semblance are of some importance if we move along the verge of photography. Semblance, however, is a tricky thing, and the problems only start with defining it. Generally, semblance is understood as a relation between two things that agree with each other in certain aspects and might be different in others. Visually, semblance thus can depend upon a lot of different aspects such as colors, forms, contrast, surfaces and the like. The aspects that in, compar that the aspects that in comparison agree can be different each time. For instance, I was told by my sister that my nephew Leon and I resemble each other and probably you will recognize a certain similarity in the features of the face and of the hair, in the color of the hair. Whether my sister's observation is true, however, you can only judge by comparing the photograph of him with the person standing in front of you. You depend on that this image has certain semblance to what he looks like. And was he here, you most certainly would be satisfied, and, as indeed there is as much semblance between him and the photograph as you can wish for, although the image is some months old. However, Leon remained in Germany, and so you have to believe... <laughs> so, however, Leon remained in Germany, and so you have to believe into the promise of photography. This promise is nearly as old as photography itself. 
It is this promise that is at the heart of all the attempts to describe how a real object or subject and its photographic images are connected. It is this promise that the early critics verbalized when they spoke of photographic images as faithful, as true to life, or as real. <coughs> Looking at photographs from that time, that is, the 19th century, their enthusiasm might come a bit as a surprise. Was, for instance, the real Vienna University towards the end of the 19th century really all brown and yellow, as this true-to-life picture suggests? Certainly not. Apparently, photography could only capture some of the properties the world looks like, mainly in the forms and shapes they deliver a certain semblance between the images and what they depicted, at the price that other aspects, such as the color of objects, gets lost or transformed in the process. And other images could be even more different to what they were meant to show. They could be of wrong colors and hues, Cont and contrasts, they could be blurred and distorted and still be recognized as a photograph. So no matter how different a photograph is to what we see with our also 40 eyes, where does the involuntary belief in the promise of photography comes from if that promise seemingly does not hold true from the very beginning? I think, I think it has much to do with the history of experiencing photography and photographs. The main business in photography till about 1910 was portraiture. Those who could afford it, mainly members of the bourgeois class, went to the studios and had their likeness taken. Made by the dozens, these photographs were shared among their peers who certainly commented on them at how well they would represent the photographed person. And as about the same time larger mirrors had become a common item in the more well-off households, the, they themselves could also compare between the photographs and what they looked like in the mirror. And they certainly recognized semblances between both. Dependent on the process, however, these images could, could look quite different. The surface, the surface of the gear type are metallic and reflecting, tint types are often yellowish and brownish and offer little contrast, while surrounded types are of a bright blue. But despite these differences, all these and a lot, of, a lot more images of different processes were commonly referred to as photographs. Given the personal experience with photographs, where semblance could be proven by comparing the image and the object, or the person and the uh, portrait, there was little reason to doubt that other pe per photographs would do differently. This was even more evident as these image images share certain properties, the most important probably the contingency of details. Much more than the painter's canvas or the paper of the graphic artist, the emulsion necessarily escapes the full control of the photographer, thus including to the photograph what the photographer may not have seen. I think you can already see my point. Recognizing photographs as photographs and that means looking at photographs without recognizing them as photographs, but rather looking through them at the object itself, has to do firstly with the experience of semblance between a photograph and an, and an object, and secondly with the recognition of semblances between different photographs of different objects. However, on the one hand, that leads to the exclusion of those images that technically might qualify as photographs, but lack those sem these semblances, such as the photoxylography and the zincotype. And on the other hand, images might be recognized as photographs that technically, technically are not, such as this rendering. It would be easy now to dim dismiss images like this one as cheating the eye, as, malicio as maliciously reneging on the promise of photography. And in fact, this has been done a lot. In discussions of di digital imagery in general, and digital photography in particular, some 10 to 15 years ago, it was often emphasized that now photography and with it, the eye could be seriously manipulated just if, as if there had been no retouching, no cropping, no coloring and the like in analog photography since its very beginning. 
Yet there is one interesting thing concerning uh, the whole question of uh, manipulation and digitality. I wonder why this topic, um, that is uh, manipulation, uh, was so hotly debated in the early years of digital photography, and I will shortly come back to that later. At this moment, I find much more important that apparently, on a first glance, we simply look at these images as photographs. And I wonder what that means to the promise of photography and to semblance. Probably you will remember my admittedly vague definition of visual semblance, that it is understood as a relation between two things that agree, that agree with each other on certain that agree with each other in certain aspects and might be different in others. Usually it is taken as a given that the specific value of photography is to be found in its ability to capture the real and represent it in images through a certain semblance to what they represent. But also you may have noticed that I've been talking much more about the differences of, photograph of photography and <coughs> photographic images to what they represent. With other words, what I've been talking mainly about is not the aspect of semblance that, leads toward, that leans towards identity, but rather about the aspects that contradict the identity between image and reality. And what I wonder about is whether those differences of photographic images to photographed objects are not an unwanted hindrance, but rather essential to our use and our understanding of photography. At first glass, glance, this may seem absurd. If photography is about capturing the real, if it is about providing records of memorable moments of our life, identity for our passports, and reliable information about the world's troubles, why should it be good if it fails in <coughs> doing so? Is not all the history of photography in general, and that of photographic technology in particular, a history of progress towards more accurate, less distorted, and more reliable pictures? Certainly, photography is about true pictures, but that does not necessarily mean that these images are true. It does, even not, me it does not even mean that these images are meant to be true. It only means that these images are attributed truth. And I'm convinced that the success of photography did depend to a great extent on this. Photography promised authentic pictures of reality while at the same time allowing to construct a desirable re reality that then could be rendered true by being photographed. 19th century portraiture is just that. If you look through these pictures, it's not, it is not only the painted backdrop that gives some of them away as altogether staged. It is also that these photographs represent a bourgeois life that only few of them will really have been able to lead. A life of leisure where work is absent except if a kid is being made into a butcher with a miniature apron or if it is a tourist in Berchtesgaden one visits the salt mines and pose, poses costumed as a miner in front of a gate made of wood, plaster and paint. On the, on other, on the other occasions people wore their Sunday best and sometimes even pretend not to notice that they were photographed, as for instance the young woman reading. Hard to believe, as the cameras were monsters in size compared to the small ones we today have in our pockets. But the photographs taken with, with those small cameras available since the late 19th century do the same. The snapshots from countless albums to a great measure show rather exceptions such as tourist trip, tr tourists' trip, weddings, afternoon teas and wars as long as they are fun and victorious. Photographs of defeats, of work or of the grinding routine of everyday life are pretty rare. News, pho news photography as well focuses on events and on the spectacular, more often than not following compositional models developed through the ages <laughs> in history painting or adding allegorical <laughs> and symbolic elements. And digital renderings, by definition, mostly do not show reality, but a world of beauty, action and leisure that parasitic to the promise of photography becomes real. or at least can be meant to become real, as with these renderings, the relation between object, object reality and image can capsize. 
It is not the image that follows the object anymore. It is rather the object that is expected to follow the image. Images as the one, uh, those one, uh, well, wait a second, yeah. Images as this one, these ones here, are phantasmatic. They don't expect being anything but symbolic, and their promise is that of the holiday under palm trees in perfect solitude, um, of uh, being uh, the spectator to a car race, um, or, or and of a real beauty made perfect through those through these little imperfections as the moles on her nose. The tricky thing about these renderings is now that they keep to the semblance to other photographic pictures, while at the same time their semblance to the object is phantasmatic. What they show often is not and was not available as an object the moment the image was created. Certainly, photography changes with that, though not in general. And it is not that the promise of photography cannot be upheld anymore. For some reasons, I think that it even uh, that this promise of photography uh, even gets strengthened to, through digital media. If you go, for instance, um, to or if you look how dif uh, different it is to photograph today with a small uh, camera, that you see already what you photograph, or you see already the image, what you. Um, uh, when you're taking it, which was not the case when, uh, in analog photography. Uh, I think the same, um, this kind of promise of, uh, the, the, uh, the promise of photography is also something you would meet, for instance, in 3D <coughs> cinema, where the um, sort of, the, the image grabs at you, and at the same time you can grab at the image, which you uh, in particular do in 3D gaming. Um, what I think actually uh, would be interesting to study, and uh, uh, Linda Williams has done a little bit on that already, is um, in particular uh, how pornography has been developed in the last, say, 20 years. Uh, that means how cameras are introduced there, how things are filmed, those cameras that, which are held close to the body, for instance, uh, where it always seems to be uh, some kind of connecting the physical body of the viewer uh, to the action that happens, uh, whatever, uh, in the image. Um, it is rather that the, with, these, uh, with, with these images, photography goes where it has not been before with, uh, with the renderings. It can go into, um, it goes into deep space, into the pre-photographic past, into the future. Exploiting the promise of photography and our trust in it, they lend reality as a po uh, they make reality into a possibility or potential to these places and times. And one way or the other, reality or rather our perception of reality adapts as it does when we fill the world with drama while reading the newspaper or making the past a pleasant chain of events, trips and experiences when perusing the analog or digital photo albums. And to come back to manipulation, I think that this kind of adaption to the new images and not the technical possibilities was the reason why manipulation was so much of a topic uh, of discussion when digital photography emerged. And at least what I concluded from this discussion was the insight that all photography, that all photography necessarily is manipulation, even if it is not meant to manipulate. So what is it? Uh, that makes us, us look at photographs as photographs, that makes us believe into the promise of photography uh, so that we look through the image and see the object no matter how the, how the image uh, has been taken. I think that both sorts of semblance are necessary for that. The semblance to the object as well as, and that object might be imaginary as we can see from the renderings, uh, the semblance to the object as well as the semblance to other photographic images and their surfaces. But at the same time, the potential of photography to be dissimilar to the real world of objects of life and life is it that we make use of when taking photographs, being photographed, or looking at photographs. Combining the promise to deliver real images or images of the real, with the potential to make everything into these kinds of pictures, no matter whether it is part of the real physical world or not, photography gives us access 
to realities that are where we are not, where we have not been, and are no more or will never be. Photography, I may conclude, is about the presence or representation of real absence. Thanks for your attention.